The Christian church has always had its enemies in this world. This is to be expected, for the church stands across the pathway of all who are opposed to God. In fact, if the church did not provoke such antagonism, it would be unfaithful to its calling. It would probably be guilty of accommodating itself to the ways of evil. Jesus himself warned, Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But in these last days, the church is suffering a new kind of attack. It comes from within, from critical spokesmen, both young and old, who are sometimes impatient and sometimes even angry in their judgment and condemnation of the church. Many of them speak with contempt for the finest creeds of the church, which they want not only to revise but to replace with more modern theologies. Indeed, they deliberately attack the very truth on which the church has stood for ages. One minister recently described this new criticism in these words. He said, Our concern today is over the strange and sometimes mystifying ways that some of the church's would-be spokesmen express their love for the church. For the fact is that the church is under severe and often brutal criticism. It is described as a cultural ghetto, simply echoing the life of its own kind regardless of their Christian commitment. It is spoken of as being backward and reactionary. It is most often accused of being irrelevant. No one is complaining that criticism is directed against the church. It always has and always will afford a splendid target for anyone who must have something to shoot at. The new fact which concerns us today is that the most devastating salvos are being fired by people within the church itself. A whole new group of theologians and Christian-oriented sociologists have been unmerciful in their impatience to see the church claim its place. Sometimes they appear to be carried away by the omniscience of their judgments. End quote. One cannot help wondering what all of this does to people outside the churches, especially those who are earnestly looking for a church because they now feel a real need for one. The church has always been looked upon as the place to go to when one is in trouble. It is known as the only institution on earth that is set here for the purpose of ministering to the deepest spiritual needs of mankind. But what must people think of it when they hear some of its most prominent spokesmen attacking the very foundations on which it rests? There are popular preachers and respected bishops who openly declare that their churches must now forsake the basic doctrines of our biblical faith. There are teachers in colleges and seminaries who take issue with the creeds of their denominations and propagate views which are in conflict with those creeds, thus creating the mood of theological skepticism and promoting the spirit of rebellion in the minds of those whom they train for the ministry. There are young men who take their ordination vows with tongue-in-cheek, even flaunting their reservations about the time-honored confessions which they are supposed to preach. No wonder there are so many ministers in the churches who insist that those confessions must be revised if they are to be honest in their pulpits. Perhaps you ask, why don't they just leave the church? If they can no longer subscribe to its teachings, why don't they get out? Why should they demand that the whole church accommodate itself to their liberal ideas, which are in conflict with everything the church believes? Apparently, the answer to that question is that they seem to have a sort of savior complex. They think they are bringing the church up to date, making it more vital, or, to use one of their weary clichés, making it more relevant in this modern world. In fact, they even picture themselves as present-day reformers of the church, appealing to the great Protestant principle that the church must always be reforming itself if it is to be the living body of Christ. Now, aside from the sheer presumption of that pedantic pose, it perverts the whole history of the Protestant Reformation. The reformers of the 16th century did not write new confessions and introduce new theologies into the church. They were not trying to bring the church up to date. On the contrary, 
they were trying to call the church back to the historic faith which it had forsaken. Every one of the Reformation creeds is a restatement of that faith founded upon the everlasting word of God. Every true reformation of the church has always been wrought in exactly the same manner. It has always been a return to the truth. Indeed, the very founding of the Christian church was like that. The apostles did not come with a new faith, but rather with a gospel which proclaimed the fulfillment of the old faith of the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament. The church of their day had forsaken that faith. It had even rejected the Christ who came to fulfill it. In other words, it had lost the truth. And so the need of the hour was a reformation, a new church that returned to the old faith of the fathers, which had now been realized in the coming of the Son of God as the Savior of the world. But if the self-styled reformers of our day succeed in their determination to move the churches away from the biblical doctrines of our historic faith, our only hope will be another reformation calling us back to those doctrines again. The signs of the times already point in that direction. We are moving toward a moment of truth in the modern church. The lines are being drawn for and against the faith of our fathers. We shall have to stand up and be counted. Now all of this may be rather confusing to the unchurched, and it may even give them more reason to ridicule the church as a house divided against itself. As a matter of fact, people are asking some very searching questions about the church today as they watch this struggle between those who want to keep the old faith and those who want to replace it with a new one. They are even asking, what is the church anyway? No, they actually don't know what it is. They are completely bewildered by all the conflicting winds of doctrine emanating from the churches. So that question needs an answer today. What is the church? After 2,000 years of history, and only four and a half centuries after the Protestant Reformation, we have to answer that question all over again. And this has to be done, mind you, for a generation that needs the true Church of Christ more desperately than did any previous one. Modern civilization is living on the brink of moral and spiritual disaster without knowing what the Church really is. Now the very first answer we must give to that question, what is the church, is that the church of Jesus Christ is the defender of the faith, the guardian of truth, the stronghold of the word of God. That's what Paul meant in his epistle to Timothy when he spoke of the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. This is a familiar picture of the church in the Bible a high tower, strong and secure, which upholds the truth of God's word in the midst of all the untruth in this world. It serves as a witness and as a fortress, for it proclaims the truth and defends it against attack. It towers above everything else in this world, for it speaks the word of God, which is the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. Thus it is the refuge for sinners who are lost in the confusion of a world that has lost the truth. Now, of course, you may know of churches that do not fit that description. As a matter of fact, maybe yours is one of them. You can see that its worst enemies are within, often working their way to the most influential positions where they can attack our historic faith with great authority behind them, and sometimes it isn't easy to expose them, not only because they occupy such highly respected positions, but because their perversion of the truth is not always detectable in its initial stages. Only when the damage has been done does it come out in the open, and then it is usually too late to do anything about it, 
except to engage in a bitter battle which invariably produces painful division. But this, too, is included in the church's task of defending the faith. No, it isn't a pleasant task. Nobody enjoys controversy within the churches, fighting the good fight of faith against those who are supposed to share it with us. But as long as the church has been in this world, it has been compelled to battle the enemies within its gates. And as long as it continues here, it will have to do that. For we know that the forces of untruth will not be content with attacking the church from without. They will always try to get inside, where they can be much more effective. Recently, a highly respected layman addressed the annual pastor's retreat of the Church Federation of Greater Chicago. He was asked to evaluate the Christian church. According to the press report, his analysis was devastating. He said, The church has retreated from society, has become irrelevant in the modern world, and has departed from the teaching of Christ. I'm quoting his words. Now, that certainly is the same thing as saying that it is no longer the true church. Remember, this is a layman speaking, and he happens to be a very knowledgeable layman, thoroughly conversant with the history of the Christian church and a deeply interested observer of its place in the modern scene. One reason for his harsh judgment, he said, was that when he prepared his address, he began asking everyone he saw, young and old, prominent and lowly, educated and uneducated, what do you think of the church? The answers he got to that question moved him to say, what I learned was that a great many people don't think about the church very much. This, he said, is a big change from the past. He noted that until about 300 years ago, Christianity influenced, pervaded, and often dominated every human calling and every human life. Art, science, philosophy, architecture, music, education, medicine, all activities were essentially religious, but today things are different. He said he couldn't think of any major happening of the last 50 years in the temporal order, the secular world, in which the church had any noticeable influence. The accuracy of that layman's judgment can hardly be gainsaid, but the question is, how do we go about making the church relevant again today? The layman's answer to that question is noteworthy. He says two things, among others, two things that must be considered seriously. First, let the church get rid of its cliches. And second, let the church rethink and restate its doctrine. He is absolutely right if he means that we must get rid of the modern cliches of liberal theology and get back to rethinking and restating the doctrines of historic biblical Christianity. That would be the only logical conclusion after hearing him accuse the church of a total departure from the teaching of Christ. The reformers of the 16th century faced essentially the same kind of problem. They too were living in a church that had lost its relevance. Yes, it had position and prestige, it had numbers and wealth, but it no longer had the power of God for the salvation of lost souls in a lost world. It had cliches, but not the gospel of God's word. And how did the reformers go about making the church relevant again? not by trying to bring it up to date in line with prevailing winds of false doctrine, not by adjusting its creeds to suit the mind of man, not by making it acceptable to a secular world, revising and refashioning its faith to fit the findings of skeptical and sophisticated scholars who could no longer embrace the supernatural facts of divine revelation. On the contrary, the reformers made the church relevant again by calling it back 
to the inspired and infallible Bible, to the ancient truth of God's word, to the historic gospel of divine grace in Jesus Christ, the gospel that Paul preached, that gave birth to the Christian church, the gospel that is written in the twelve articles of our apostolic creed. In other words, the reformers were defenders of the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. They came to grips with its enemies, not only out in the world, but especially in the church. And this explains why the Reformation became such a mighty force among the nations, in all the affairs of men, in every area of life. It spoke the living word of God to the deepest need of mankind, the need to make peace with God at the cross of his Son, and therefore it could speak significantly and powerfully to the whole context of human problems in which that basic need comes to expression. Talk about being relevant. When has Christianity ever been more relevant? When did it ever do so much for the salvation of men and the shaping of their cultures? Why, the very treasures of freedom and justice, human dignity and decency, come to us from the gospel which the reformers preached. Yes, they were defenders of a faith which is the fountain of freedom. How incredibly stupid that today men should talk about making the church more relevant by abandoning those very same doctrines which made the churches of the Reformation so strikingly relevant in their day. How can a church ever hope to be relevant in a world of sin if it no longer preaches the supernatural word of God? What about your church and what about mine? Is it a tower of truth or a tower of Babel? A defender of the faith or a destroyer of the faith? Does it stand in the living tradition of the reformers, the apostles, the prophets, and the patriarchs? Or has it forsaken that mainstream of God's true church? Is it a church that God can use to meet the basic need of modern man, his need of eternal salvation? And what about you? Do you belong to that kind of church? Have you found your Savior in it? Are you giving it your life? Are you bringing up your children in it? Are you involved in its worldwide program of missions and education, reaching lost souls with the gospel and shedding the light of truth upon the problems of our times? Remember, our failures at this point make our churches stumbling blocks rather than stepping stones for thousands of people who should be finding their way into the one great everlasting church of God which he has purchased with the blood of his Son.